This evening we're looking at a passage in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. At least uh, we're going to uh, look at this passage as what it is that baptism, baptism with water, is actually representing. We've already seen it in the Titus passage, the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. And here we see the term baptism used to refer to that. But let me just go ahead and back up to verse 1 and read through verse 14 to get this passage in context. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes to the Corinthians, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. <clears throat> Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is a Lord except by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the, the one Spirit. And to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit... We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now again, my purpose this evening isn't to deal with these gifts, which uh, largely we believe have, have passed away because their purpose has been fulfilled in the completion of the word of God. But what we want to focus on is what we see in verses 12 through 14 with regard to the body being many members, but especially how it is we are brought into the body of Christ, and that is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what we're going to want to see is that water baptism is basically a picture of this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we also need to realize this, that this baptism of the Holy Spirit is that which places us in Jesus Christ and grants to us all the blessings that are actually in him. And again, we're going to want to see how that works. But as we prepare to come to the table, let me just remind you that it, it reminds us that Jesus Christ is to be our source of spiritual nourishment. We are to receive everything that we need through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, baptism also reminds us of the same thing that it is the work of the Holy Spirit to place us in Jesus Christ where we might receive all of those blessings. And again, both in the supper and in baptism, we receive those blessings through faith. Now, you've already heard that this series, again, as you know if you've been here for the past several Lord's Day evenings, has to do with the means of grace. We've just prayed that God would use us to give glory to him. And that's not something we can do in our own strength. We need the help that God provides us. We need to put off our sins and to put on Christ if we are to be successful in serving the Lord. But the way we do that is through these particular means. Again, using these means as well as I've already said, not giving in to sin, not losing the influence of the spirit we gain through these means. Now, last week we looked at the Lord's Supper and what it is, what's actually going on when we come to the table, how we are having a real communion with Jesus Christ. I mean, the one who is the only true Lord who is seated at the right hand of God, that he comes down, as it were, spiritually, and he is with us to commune with us, to communicate to us 
the gracious influences of his Holy Spirit. There is communion. And there is, as I've already mentioned, this spiritual feeding upon the Lord Jesus Christ, which is, again, interestingly represented in Scripture as an eating of his flesh and a drinking of his blood, which we know is not literal, but is meant to convey to us the idea that Jesus is the bread of life. He is our source of spiritual nourishment. We are to look to him by faith and receive everything that we need for life and godliness. And, of course, the supper also is a reminder of what Jesus Christ has done for us, how he died, how he gave his life for ours. And, of course, the Lord's Day, as we saw this morning, is to remind us of his resurrection. But as we think about these things, to remember that what Jesus Christ went through, if you're trusting him, he went through those things for you so that, quite literally, you were with him in a certain sense. You died with him. You were raised with him to newness of life. And now you are to serve him. The Lord's table is to remind you that you have died with Christ. And again, baptism has somewhat of a similar meaning. So as surely as we eat and drink in faith, so surely he has lived and died for us, and so surely also we are nourished by his life. We do need to remember to look to those things and to remember them and to look to Christ by faith as we come to the table so that we might actually receive those blessings. Now this evening we're going to consider baptism. And we're not going to consider it from an aspect that we might typically look at it, which is uh, who should be baptized and how should they be baptized, although those are questions, as you know, that have been discussed in the church over the years and there's a variety of opinions. But we want to look at it as a means of grace. How can those of us who have, been, who have been baptized use that baptism to build us up in Christ, to gain spiritual strength? Now, as a means of grace, we do need to understand that we can only use our baptism if we actually have faith. Because baptism isn't really going to benefit us unless we have it. We have to have faith to receive the benefits, just as coming to the table also requires faith. If you don't have <clears throat> faith, when you come to the table, you not only don't receive the benefit, but you actually receive judgment, which is why we have that warning before we come to the table to examine ourselves to make sure that we are in the faith and that we are repenting of our sins. So with baptism, we also have to have faith to receive the blessings that God actually uh, shows us and seals to us in our baptism. Now this evening, I want us to look at two things. I want us to see what baptism is, and then I want to see how we can use it as a means to grow spiritually stronger. So first of all, what is baptism? Well, those of you, of course, who've seen baptisms know that, uh, again, there's differing modes of baptism. Some believe in sprinkling, some believe in pouring, some believe in immersion. But the one thing they all have in common is that they all involve water, and they all involve a washing of some kind. And I believe that that is really what the image is that we are to see in baptism. It is this washing, this washing with water, that actually represents the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Actually, I want us to see that there are three things in baptism, actually three things perhaps that we can look at it as. First of all, it is a picture of this washing. It is a seal or a declaration by God that if we've trusted in the Lord that our sins are forgiven, and it is a mark of his ownership upon us. It is a sign of his covenant. So first of all, let's consider it as a picture. As a picture, it, it symbolizes what we've already seen in our text, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that places us in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, spirit baptism is actually something that has been disputed as well as just about everything else in the Bible among Christians. Spirit baptism is not a second experience that gives to us or conveys to us the ability to speak in tongues. 
Spiritual baptism is not a second blessing that renders us absolutely perfect and infallible and without sin. Spirit baptism is actually that work of the Holy Spirit that unites us with the Lord Jesus Christ, that plugs us into him, that puts us in Christ, even as we are reminded through the, um, the memory verse, as in Adam all die. And we are all in Adam by virtue of the fact that we are his descendants and that he represented us in the garden. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. How is a person in Christ? Well, it's only through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that act of the Spirit, again, that places us in Jesus, that plugs us into him, into his life, so that his life flows through us and we become alive, spiritually alive, we're raised from the dead so we can trust in Jesus that connects us to him um, legally so that his righteousness becomes ours and our sin is removed. It's that baptism that actually saves us. I want you to notice that Paul here does not refer to the baptism of the Holy Spirit as something that some Christians have and other Christians don't have. He says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body that is the body of Christ, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of that one spirit. So this is not something that only some Christians experience. This is something that every Christian experience. Now, water baptism symbolizes this act of the Holy Spirit. As water is applied and it washes away, as it were, the, the filth on the flesh, so the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit applies to us Jesus Christ and his merits and his sacrifice, and it washes away the impurity of our sins. Now, this can only happen in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit baptizes us into Jesus Christ, and then what Christ has done becomes ours. You know, the Old Testament, or I should say in the Old Covenant, there was a sign also that um, represented exactly the same thing, and that was circumcision. Circumcision of the flesh was to remind the people of God that they were to circumcise their hearts, that they were to have their spirits or their souls renewed by the grace of God by trusting in the Messiah who was to come. And it was accomplished exactly in the same way that this baptism of the Spirit is as well. We say it's the Old Testament counterpart of this New Testament reality. But those who trusted in Jesus Christ in the Old Covenant also had this baptism of the Holy Spirit that placed them into Christ so that they were saved. Those in the Old Testament were saved exactly, or the Old Covenant were saved in exactly the same way that we are saved today, not by our works, because we don't have any good works. Our works are filthy rags. But by trusting in Jesus Christ, they trusted in the Messiah who was coming. And we trust in the Messiah who has come. Now, the only difference between the two signs is that circumcision was a bloody sign, whereas baptism isn't. And that's because that ordinance was pointing towards the blood of Christ, which was yet to be shed. And once Jesus Christ came and laid down his life and shed his blood for our sins, we no longer needed a sign that would point to that sacrifice, but rather one that points to what that sacrifice accomplishes, which is the washing of regeneration, again, the removal of our sins by this washing of the Holy Spirit. So baptism, water baptism, is a picture of the spirit baptism that places us into the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's a picture. Now it's also a seal. And again, by a seal, I don't mean something that, that seals you up as it were, or locks you away, but rather a seal in the sense of an official declaration, like a king would put a seal upon a, a, his royal document, showing that that document comes with his authority, with his power behind it. This is something that the Lord actually places upon us as a seal, a declaration that if we have believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, that his spirit has in fact placed us in Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away, 
Christ's righteousness has clothed us and we are saved. It's basically God's declaration that if we've trusted Jesus, we are safe from judgment. And then finally, it's also his mark of ownership. It's something he places on us to show that we belong to him. Again, in the Old Covenant, that mark was circumcision. If somebody were to join the people of God from the outside, they would have to be circumcised if they were male. And all of those within the, the covenant community, within the church, the Old Covenant church, had to, to receive that mark. That was the mark of God's ownership, that they had been received into the visible church. Now, that same thing is accomplished today by way of baptism. It shows that they are a part, whoever receives it is a part of the visible church, not the invisible church, and that God owns them. They belong to him. Now, by the way, I should point out that not everyone in the Old Covenant who received the mark of circumcision was saved. The vast majority of them were not saved. And not everybody in the New Covenant who receives the mark of baptism is saved because it's not something that actually brings the baptism of the Spirit about. It's not something that saves you. It's only something that is a picture of it and a seal of it if you have faith. Otherwise, as I mentioned before, if you don't have faith, it works against you. It uh, actually can bring greater judgment upon you. So again, it doesn't affect it, but it does picture it. So water baptism is a picture of the Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit that places you in Jesus. It is a seal or a guarantee that if you have faith, then his blood has washed away all your sins and paid, satisfied God's justice for you. And it is a mark of God's ownership upon you of being included in the visible expression of the kingdom of heaven that is in the visible church. So that's what baptism is, a picture a seal, and a mark. Now that's, again, going to be important because we're going to see how to use it as a means of grace, and each of those has a use as far as how we can be strengthened spiritually through baptism. So how is baptism used as a means of grace? Well, you know, it, it's used, I believe, in the same way that the other means of grace are used as something that God shows us that we are to receive by faith. Uh, one thing that we need to recognize about the means of grace is that virtually all of them in some way are a ministry of the word of God. Now with some of these means, it's not hard to understand how that works. When you read the word of God, that certainly involves the word, doesn't it? You have to read it. When the word of God is preached. That certainly involves the word too because what I'm doing is I'm reading the scriptures and I'm explaining them to you. When we fellowship, is the word of God used in our fellowship? Well, it is if we exhort one another or admonish one another or encourage one another or teach one another. A lot of the one another's have to do with a communication of the word of God. I was trying to think of exceptions to this and perhaps there's, there's two. Uh, when we fellowship, we also share our faith and we also share love, which is not necessarily, I mean, I suppose in expressing those things, we do it verbally and perhaps we use the word of God that's involved in that, but we also have to recognize that not every aspect of our love for one another and care is going to be a communication of the word and not every display of faith and confidence in the Lord is going to be necessarily a ministry of the word. So there may be some means that God has given to us that don't in directly involve the word, although we also have to recognize that there's certainly the result of the word and the spirit of God working through the word. Now, why do I bring this up with regard to the word? Well, it's because of what the sacraments are, actually. Uh, the Lord doesn't call them so much these things, but this is what they are. They are the word of God in a visible form, in a tangible form. Uh, it is another expression of God's word. Now, we don't often think of the Lord's Supper as the word of God. 
But as a matter of fact, the Lord's Supper does preach to us a particular message every time it's celebrated. I mean, what does the Supper actually say to us? Well, it tells us that Jesus Christ died for sinners. It tells us if we're trusting in Jesus Christ that his death was for you and that it was to save you. It tells you that you need to be fed spiritually, that there is a spiritual feasting that, that, that you need to participate in in order to be strong, that you need this heavenly manna. You need Jesus Christ. You need to draw your strength from him. Again, his flesh is true food. His blood is true drink. And this reminds us of our need to feed upon Jesus. Again, that's terminology you'll only hear within Reformed circles. And it's not literal eating of flesh and drinking of blood, but it is looking to Jesus and drawing from him spiritual life and strength and nourishment. He is the only source of these things. That's what the Lord's table reminds us. So the table is a visible word that communicates certain things to us. But again, as it's been written also in church history, I believe Calvin was the one perhaps who first said it, that it is mute without the written word, which is why we need the word of God to explain what it is and what it represents. That's one of the reasons why we read the institution of the table before we come to it, because by itself it doesn't really tell us anything unless we already know from the word of God what it actually means. So it's a visible word that is mute, but explained by God's word. Now the same thing is true of baptism. Baptism is also a visible word. As a picture, it reminds us of God's grace, this act of the Spirit's baptizing us into Jesus Christ that puts us in Jesus as purely an act of his grace and of his mercy. It speaks to us as a seal. Remember I said, it's God's declaration that if we have truly believed that even as the water of baptism is applied to us and washes away the filth of the flesh or the external body, so Christ's blood has washed away the impurity of our souls and we are clean and we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that we are saved. That's God's declaration. And as a mark, it reminds us that God has set us apart from the world, that he has called us to be his people, and that we are to live, because of that, a godly life. We are to live differently. We are to live separate lives. Now let's delve into these things a little bit, a little bit more. First of all, it's a picture. Now how are we going to use this as a means of grace? Well, first of all, it reminds us that there is grace. There is grace to wash away our sins, grace to cleanse us, grace to remove all the filth and impurity that is in our souls. Remember that we came into the world, all of us, guilty. Guilty from the very inception, from the very conception of our lives. Guilty because of what Adam did. We had his guilt credited to us because he was our representative. So we come into the world guilty, and by the way, that's the reason, I believe, why we come into the world as sinners. Because with this guilt, there is corruption. Even as when Adam first sinned, he lost the influence of the Spirit. He became corrupt. And of course, that, corrupt, that corruption of soul is, is certainly brought down to us. We have corrupt parents, and they have to have corrupt children. Corrupt parents can't have perfect children but also that immediate guilt of Adam imputed to us. It reminds us that there is guilt, but it also reminds us that there is grace offered by God and actually given to those who have faith to cleanse away that guilt in Jesus Christ alone. By remembering baptism too in this washing with water, it reminds us of our need to be cleansed of our sins and to look to Jesus Christ for that cleansing. So again, as a picture, it's a constant reminder to us that we need to look to Jesus for the cleansing of our sins, that there is, as it were, a, a, a laver, I don't want to put it quite that way, but there is this, this basin, as it were, this, this, this fountain of virtue, 
that we can come to that is in heaven but will be applied to us as we look to Jesus Christ in faith. We will be cleansed and washed of all of our sins. So baptism reminds us that there is impurity, but there is cleansing for that. And so we need to look to Jesus Christ by faith for that cleansing. By the way, the Bible says that if we are true believers, that we will continually be confessing our sins and looking to Jesus Christ for the cleansing of those sins. That faith is not a one-time act. Some people treat faith as though that's what it is. I went forward 20 years ago and I prayed that prayer. I know that I'm saved even though I haven't walked with God, I haven't prayed, I haven't read the word, I haven't lifted my finger to obey. I still went forward 20 years ago. Now, that means nothing to the Lord except that you're perhaps more culpable for your sins. Faith is something you do all the time. It's something that you are constantly exercising toward the Lord for the forgiveness of your sins and the receiving of that cleansing and of that strengthening that you need. Well, again, baptism reminds you of that. Now, secondly, as a seal, it seals to you that cleansing and that forgiveness of sins. It is God's declaration that your guilt has been washed away if you have looked to Jesus Christ, if you have trusted him. Your sin's gone, and it can no longer condemn you. You're free from sin, and you are righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have faith, then the Lord wants you to look back at your baptism and receive that testimony as God's declaration that your sins have been washed away and that you are safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there's another way that baptism and the Lord's Supper can actually strengthen your assurance besides the way we've just looked, besides the fact that it's God's seal, his, his guarantee, his declaration to you that your sins are forgiven, and that is in how you actually come to these ordinances. At least in the Lord's Supper, it's, it's universal in, in baptism. It's a little bit more selective. But with, regarding to the, with regard to the Supper, I mean, how do you actually get to the supper? Well, in a broad evangelical church, it usually happens by showing up at a service. They're having the Lord's Supper. The tray is passed around. Everybody gets it. And so there isn't really this distinction going on and it really doesn't say to you what it ought to say to you. But in a Reformed church, how do you get to the table? Do you just show up on the Lord's Day or having the Lord's Supper and, and you get it? No, you know that to come to the table that we require that you be a member of an evangelical church, which means that you've gone through a process of examination by the elders. The elders listen to your testimony. They, they examine you on your understanding of what the gospel is, and they seek to see as, as far as they can, humanly speaking, whether or not your belief is correct and whether your uh, testimony, as it were, is believable or credible. And so if you are honestly sharing what you know and what you believe and what you've experienced and the elders examine this and determine on the basis of that testimony that you are a true believer, then your assurance isn't based just upon your own assessment of your belief and of your life, but also on that of God's elders who hold the keys of the kingdom either to open the doors of the visible kingdom and let you into the visible church or not to do so. So in other words, your assurance can be strengthened by the fact that you have been examined by the elders. Well, the same thing can be true of baptism, at least if you were baptized as an adult because there is an examination that comes before baptism that gives this added level of assurance in the same way that the Lord's Supper or being examined to the Lord's, come to the Lord's Supper would, that can strengthen your faith because after they examine you, they apply this, again, as God's seal to your testimony that you are a true believer as far as they can tell humanly speaking. So again, it is a picture that points us to the cleansing that is there in the Lord Jesus Christ and of our need continually to go to him for that cleansing. 
And it is a seal and a declaration by God that if we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, our sins have been washed away by his blood. But thirdly, it can be a means of grace as God's mark of ownership upon our lives. Because that mark, the fact that we belong to God, the fact that we are in his church, calls us to a particular standard of life. Now, when we look at our baptism, we need to remember that it obligates us to live according to God's standards, to do what God expects you to do as his child. And by the way, what does God expect you to do? It's the same thing he expects you to do or expected you to do when you made profession of faith. I don't know if you remember what those vows were that you took, but basically you said this is what you would do, that you would continue to believe God's word and to receive his gospel as the only way of salvation, that you would receive God as the true God, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you would confess your sinfulness, your absolute need of the Lord Jesus Christ because you cannot save yourself because you are a sinner. And that you resolved, when you took those vows, to forsake your sins, to forsake the world, to resist Satan, and to live a godly life. One last thing that you also resolved to do or vowed to do was to be faithful in your worship to the Lord. Not only to attend his worship services, but that your whole life would be a continual act of worship to him. So this is what you were engaged to do when you were baptized. This is what it means to be a Christian. I mean, you're, you're receiving God's mark of ownership upon you. Remember Jesus says, you know, the one who believes is to be baptized. And those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who don't believe will not be saved and so forth. But that baptism is taking upon yourself that obligation to do all that the Lord has called you to do. And so when you look at your baptism, how can that be a means of grace to you? Well, it's because, again, it's not just a picture of what Jesus Christ has done or what he's willing to do if you trust. And it's not just a declaration that the Lord has cleansed you of your sins if you have trusted, but it's also the reminder that you are under the obligations of the new covenant, that God expects from you a certain uh, caliber, a certain level of, of living, which is much higher than the standard that the world presents to you. It's actually a standard of perfection. God calls you to be perfect. He calls you to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, every time you think about baptism, these are the things that you should be thinking about. And by the way, I was just mentioning to Greg earlier, how many of us even think about the fact that we were baptized? And if we do, that's about all we do is that, yeah, I received baptism years ago. I made public profession of faith or however it may be. I was baptized. But we don't think about what that baptism means or what it calls us to do. And so when we think about baptism, and this is what we ought to do, think about it, we do have to remember baptism because unlike the Lord's Supper, it's a one-time act. You don't need to be baptized numerous times. You only need to be baptized the one time. And it's, so it's something you have to look back on if you are a believer. You need to remember these things. Your need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ to make sure that you are believing in him, trusting him, and receiving him. You need to remember God's seal that if you have believed, you are in Christ. Your sins are washed away. You're clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. And you need to let that stir you up to be thankful so that you may do what the mark of his ownership calls you to do which is to live a different kind of life, to forsake the world, not to live like the rest of the world, going after the things the rest of the world goes after, but rather to live the life that God calls you to live, to forsake the world, to fight against Satan and your flesh, and to see yourself as being dead to yourself, 
and risen with Christ now to live for his glory alone. Baptism is meant to remind us of all these things and to show us all these things. It, it like the Lord's Supper, is preaching to us a sermon. And the Lord wants us to remember those particular things that he is showing to us in this visible way. Again, we have to remember it because it's not something that happens all the time. We're not having baptisms every week, as you know. Very seldom we have baptisms, but we need to remember our baptism and what it reminds us of. So may the Lord help us. He gave us baptism to strengthen us. That's the, these, these are the reasons why he gave it, is so we would see these things and remember these things. So if you've been baptized, look at those things. See what it calls you to do, what it calls you to remember, to look to Christ, and if you have believed that you are cleansed, and remember what it calls you to be as a child of God, to live a godly life, to be like Jesus Christ. Well, may the Lord help all of us to, to make a better use of our baptism than we have up to this point so that we might grow in grace and give glory and honor to him. Let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to help us do that.